You're listening to the Fan to Fan Podcast, Episode 7. Welcome to Fan to Fan Podcast. This is your host, Bernie Gonzalez. I am here with my friend, my boy, Andre Walker. What's up, B? So we are here for part two of the Marvel Cinematic Universe discussion, where we talk about the history of Marvel's movies. We started with a few of the TV films, the Dolph Lundgren Punisher film, David Hasselhoff's amazing version of Nick Fury, and then we... Uh, we talked about Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, and we finished with Mark Steven Johnson's Daredevil. Uh, so we finished up with 2002, and now we are in 2003. So well before the Marvelverse uh, universe that we see now in theaters, we now have the sequel to X-Men 2 in 2003, again directed by Brian Singer. And with Hugh Jackman, again, playing the role of Wolverine. And we introduce a few more mutants. One of the big ones, Alan Cummings, plays Nightcrawler. So he can bamf his way to the screen. So, Dre, what do you remember about X-Men 2 or X2? X-Men 2 is the Empire Strikes Back to me in the comic book superhero movie lore. Everything that everybody had a complaint about X-Men 1, Brian Singer took a notepad down, jotted it down, and he almost surgically made sure that they address it in the first X-Men movie. One thing they wanted to see, they wanted to see Mystique, more Mystique. They loved Mystique in the first one, they see more. They gave her a bigger role in the, in the second one. We wanted to see Wolverine, and we wanted to see Wolverine's Berserker Rage. To this day, it's still the best scene with Wolverine in it, Very that true. scene, in any X-Men movie. It's in full Berserker mode. Full Berserker mode. Yes. In a PG movie, and it's still, he was able to pull it off. You wanted to see Magneto be more menacing. Magneto pulls the metal out of one guy's body. You know, he, 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 uh, he escapes the prison. He, he is more menacing in this movie. You want to see the X-Men use their powers more and be more well-rounded characters. And you get to see that, and you get to see the new characters come in and shine. It's one of the, my favorite sequel it's one of my favorite superhero movies of all time it's one of my favorite sequels definitely my i think it's my favorite second behind a movie we'll talk about later on as my second favorite superhero sequel of all time i think uh it's huh. it's a great job that brian singer did with x-men 2 i thought x-men 1 was was really good mm -hmm. that intro scene mm -hmm. in the concentration camp that always stuck with me the relationship mm -hmm. between patrick stewart and ian mckellen as professor x and mm -hmm. magneto that was great. Hugh Jackman was great as Wolverine. Mm -hmm. But the movie itself, and, and I don't know, I don't want to blame Brian Singer because Usual Suspects was a great movie. Mm -hmm. But then when he touched X-Men, there was something missing for me. Mm -hmm. So I never really gravitated to it. But then again, the disclaimer being, I never really gravitated to the X-Men comics. Mm -hmm. So when the X-Men movies came out in theaters... It's not like I was first in line to see them. As a fan, mm -hmm. I was in line to see them. I think, if I remember right, you and I saw X-Men 1 with our friend Chris. Mm -hmm. But when X-Men 2 came out, for me, I just thought, okay, X-Men 1 was great, was was okay. I don't know that X-Men 2 will be great. I thought it was good. But again, X-Men never rang a bell with me. So it's kind of, it, it's, it lost a little bit's luster right from the get-go. Yeah, I think that it, it hit me. Right away, uh, one of my favorite scenes and a scene that my father is a big comic book fan and he likes the movie. The scene that really grabbed him right away too was that the Nightcrawler scene you talked about with him bamping through the mansion. Yes. And right away, fans of X Men get to see one of their favorite cult characters in Nightcrawler actually use looking like he does in the comics and using his powers exactly the way he did in the comics. And with them showing him bamping, taking out the Secret Service to try to kill the president, and that classical music playing through there. It really set a tone that this was going to be a much well-financed, better shot movie than the first movie. And everything was so much better. I mean, they Halle Berry dropped her bad accent and just went with her regular uh, spoken uh, dialect. She got a much better wig for the Storm wig. It looked, I mean, it's funny, but yeah, that yeah. first wig was horrible. And yeah. the second one, it looked like they actually tried. I mean, the first wig looked like something they went to the store and just say, pick one, put it on. This one looked like they fitted it. They made it shorter. They made it fit for a head. 
they didn't improve the costumes that much, but they did improve the, the, the I remember the cockpit for the Blackbird and in the, in the, in the original Blackbird, the X-Men's jet, it looked like this little cramped thing where yes. you could barely move. But in the new one, they could they could get up, they could walk around, they could do stuff. And it was like, wow, they changed it. It's a small thing, Cyclops' visor. Look at Cyclops' visor in the first one. He's got sort of like the Princess Leia buns on the side of it. Yes. And in the new one, they sort of streamlined it and made it slicker and sleeker. They they did you know uh, uh, Jean Grey's hair looked a lot better. I mean, and the story was and, and that, that's just uh, aesthetics. I mean, the story was much more darker. It was more detailed, dealing with trying to cure mutants and find mutants, and we find a little bit more about Wolverine's past. We see some of the new mutants like uh, 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 Lady Shiva. Is that her name? Yes, that's right, Lady Deathstrike. Lady Deathstrike. Sorry, Sorry. Lady Deathstrike. Yes. Deathstrike. Yes. Yes. Uh, played about Kelly, Kelly, you, Kelly, you. Mm -hmm. We see Pyro. Yes. You know, Pyro is actually a member of the X Men match, which I thought was pretty cool. And he changes sides and, and joins up with the X Men. I thought was pretty cool. We see Striker. You know, what I mean, the guy who put Wolverine in the Antimanium program. We get to see that cool scene where Wolverine gets the Antimanium put inside of him. So it was a darker movie and it was a better movie. I, I, I still to this day, I really think that Brian Singer did it. And then we got a little taste. Of the Phoenix Saga, a little taste of the Phoenix Saga when Jean Grey started, uh, power started to, to manifest, and we get to see how powerful she really is. It was so cool that he handled it subtly, and it did a good job of of so of doing a slow build up to Jean and the sacrifice she did at the end that was supposed to lead to the the uh, potential sequel that we didn't get. But I think everything that Brian Singer he said himself, he said, like I said in the last podcast, Brian Singer said. He felt the first X-Men trailer was basically a trailer, a commercial for the new one. And then the second one actually, to me, got everything right and was everything right about. If you're an X-Men fan, everything about X-Men 2 was right. And I don't think there was much to complain about that they got wrong. Well, you're going to get a third. But for the third, mm. later on in 2003, mm. Universal releases Hulk. Ooh. Directed by Ang Lee. Ooh. The Bad Green Destiny. Right off across. I mean, across the board. Did not receive critical acclaim. Oof. Box office, uh, it was around 60. But, you know, with most films, if a movie gets $100 million in its first weekend, it will almost always lose 50% of its box office in its second, second weekend. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and Hulk was one of those movies that had a 70% drop. It was a film that was not critically acclaimed. Fans didn't like it. And I think it will always remember, for me, symbolically, mm -hmm. the poster – where he was reaching towards the towards you, mm -hmm. right, as a person looking at him, and the Hulk's face was somewhat hidden by his hand. Mm -hmm. That was really the whole movie. It's mm -hmm. like Ang Lee didn't really want to show the Hulk. No, he he didn't want to show no. him as a forget the hero idea. He didn't want to show him really as a monster, as a character on the screen. Th this was about Eric Bana, who played Bruce Banner. Um, but th there were a lot of psychological things that yeah. they were trying to pull across like things with with relationships with fathers um trauma. relationship with sons trauma absolutely i remember there was an interview where uh 24 mm -hmm. the series starring keith or sutherland mm -hmm. was really big at the time and he saw some of the multi-shot screens and yes. he thought that would be yes. interesting to see and a lot of people film. actually like that they thought that it gave a big comic book cut May it felt like it was comic book where the, the panels kind of swiped in and swiped out. And I didn't have a complaint about that as far as the movie. The And the cast was actually a solid cast with yes. Eric Bana, Jennifer Connelly, who I still think is just beautiful, yes. as uh, Betty Betty uh, Betty Ross. Let alone a great actress. Uh, a great she was actress. really good as she Betty was, Ross. Good uh, counterpart to, to Eric Bana as an actor. A great actress. A great actress. Yes. Uh, and you have Sam Elliott as a Thunderbolt Ross, who looks like he was ripped right out of the book for yes. Thunderbolt Ross. Uh, I forget the guy Luke uh, was it? No, I don't know. If it was Luke Evans who played the uh, Ned Talbot? The actor who played Ned Talbot was appropriately annoying. You want to see him get his comeuppance, and, and it was a pretty solidly cast movie. And 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 I respect Ang Lee, and I and I give him a a smart a smidgen of credit for trying to do something outside the box with the Hulk. He, he was trying to do something more than just a m monster smash movie, but the Hulk kind of is a Frankenstein monster movie and he was trying to do something totally different with Bruce Banner dealing with trauma of watching his father kill his mother and it was just like what are we watching Bruce Banner's father murders his mother and he's he represses that rage and now he's no but that's it, like across the film because like if you think of Ang Lee's movies right yes, yes, so yes. you think of 
Eat Drink Man Woman, mm. Crouching Tiger, uh, Hidden Dragon, Broke Man Mountain, Broke Back Mountain, which was after the Hulk. Mm. But there's a lot of stuff about conflict, about mm. tradition, mm. Uh, things about repressed hidden emotions. Mm -hmm. And that was yeah, his yeah, yeah. version of the Hulk. Yes. And after seeing Spider Man come to the screen mm -hmm. and done well, X Men, again, not a fan favorite for me, but nonetheless, it came huge out hit, and hit. huge hit. For Fox, for Marvel, mm -hmm. and they say, yes, we can do this for the screen. It works out well. So you know what we'll go do? We'll go do the Hulk, the green giant. He'll go through. And there was always that scene, I remember in the trailer, where he fought the tank. Yes. And he grabbed the the long you know, barrel of the gun, of the, of the tank, and just kind of hit it. And you saw a glimpse for what you thought was Hulk smash Hulk moment. Hulk smash. You talked yes. about Wolverine's Berserker Rage. Yes. X-Men 2. You're thinking, all right, this is going to be the scene. All right, this is going to be awesome. You know, CGI aside, we're going to see the Hulk in full green Hulk rage mode. And what we got was we're Hulk, still waiting for it. Yeah, Hulk at least in the introspective. Hulk. Hulk think about childhood. Hulk think about father's abandonment. I don't want to see Hulk. I didn't. I didn't want to see Hulk deal with. Did you want to see issues. Hulk smash? No, I wanted to see Hulk smash. Did Hulk, you want to see Hulk dogs? Hulk deal. And that's the scene to me. You talk about that poster. That's the scene that people go down in history. Is that. He couldn't figure out a villain. The, the villain, I guess, was his father and he came his water or whatever. But the big fight scene. And his in dad the movie, was played by Nick Nolte. Nick Nolte was him fighting giant poodles yes. and dogs. Yes. Wow. I mean, wow. It was a huge disappointment for me because I'm a fan of Ang Lee. And of course, I'm a huge fan of the Incredible Hulk. So. Hulk is a hard character. Yes. I mean, if you no, think about... Actually, no, he's... No, but if you th think about, like, the comics, right? Mm -hmm. So they've done Planet Hulk, mm -hmm. and that was successful. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, Hulk has kind of, like, this yeah. interesting thing where it's just kind of, like, you have to play around with him. Is he smart Hulk? Is he dumb Hulk? If he's smart Hulk, they've done the Grey Hulk, the mobster kind of, like, bodyguard, mm -hmm. mobster Hulk. They've done a bunch of different things in the comics. But when you think of, like, what's, like, the core version of Hulk... You know, he's he's the Jekyll and Hyde, right? Yeah. Smart Bruce Wayne and Banner, the, Banner, the, Banner. Banner, sorry. Thank you. Oh, maybe different guy. Uh, speaking of someone who's Jekyll and Hyde, mm -hmm. uh, you have Bruce Banner who has the intelligence, who has, you know, the, this thing inside him that explodes and comes out in the Hulk. And then the Hulk is kind of like this creature, a force of nature. And we didn't get to see any of that. No. Any of it. Nothing. And with a cast and overall production pretty good production values. It's oh, not yeah. like it was an inexpensive film. No, Universal put money into and it. And I actually liked the CG design for the Incredible Hulk. I thought it looked great. I And they, they based it off of Eric Banner's face. And I mean, personally to me, we'll get to the other maybe Hulks and other Hulk movie and, 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 and uh, incarnations of the Hulk. I still thought the face of that Incredible Hulk was the best looking Hulk. That, yes. that Eric Banner sort of stretched out bulky face. It looks like the Hulk in the comic. It looks sort of like uh, Peter David's. I think isn't it? That's yes. the artist. Peter David's Hulk. That big. The Dale Keon. Uh, yeah. Dale he, Dale Peter Keon. David yes. and Dale Keon. Yeah, yeah, yes. Dale Keon. Not, not Peter David. the writer. Dale Keon who, did, who created Pitt. It look, his Hulk looked like, go look at that Hulk and go look at Dale Keown's Hulk. It kind of looked like that Hulk. And I, I actually liked the way the Hulk looked. So it wasn't about, they were cheap. I think Ang Lee just wanted to do something different with the Hulk. And it's okay to do something like that with a CD list character. But with somebody as the Hulk who had the TV show and was a fan favorite and popular. My, my mother watched the Incredible Hulk TV show and my father watched it. They loved it and they were watching it and they, my father at least watched it. He was dun, like, what dun, 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 What the heck is this? And my mother, dun, dun, she just liked to see the Hulk. She just like, she loves love the Hulk and Hulk was punching stuff and she was happy but dun, dun, my father dun, dun, and me and my brother, we were like what is this? This is, no. Yeah, I remember, just when you think about like all the movies that he's done like Sense and Sensibility, The Wedding Banquet. I know like, I don't know if Brian Singer, if you saw At Pupil and you would automatically think, all right, that's the guy to direct X-Men. Mm -hmm. But when you saw Ang Lee and you were in a room and you were looking at his resume and his style mm -hmm. and the things that he likes to put on screen, I don't know if he would be the guy that I would think, you know what, that's going to be the director of The Hulk when mm -hmm. we finally see him in the first theatrical big yeah. screen version after Lou Ferrigno, which yes. we all associate with, exactly. with the, the Hulk, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in 2004, just a year after The Hulk, we have one of your favorite characters probably of all time. The Punisher. The Thomas Jane Punisher movie. 
that movie, uh, yeah, that was one of. I think I know that wasn't. Is was that Mark Steven Johnson? That wasn't Mark Steven Johnson. I don't think it was not. No, uh, but the, uh, the 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 yeah, that movie was it was it's it was a, it was it was a lot of stuff that got right with that movie. Uh, Thomas Jane, uh, Thomas Jane was pretty decent as the Punisher. He wasn't my first choice as the Punisher, but he was pretty decent. I think it was on cable a little while ago, and I was actually rewatching some of it again. And there was a, some stuff in there that got right. I think where the movie really dropped the ball was with the planning of the Punisher's revenge. And we as fans of the Punisher knows that the Punisher's revenge is going out and taking out a bunch of criminals. But in this movie, the Pun Punisher plotted a long complicated plot to get revenge to frame people for thinking other people did stuff and tricking other people to believe he did this i mean that would work if take the punisher name off of it maybe that would be interesting to see some guy work behind the scenes to get other people to backstab each other and think this guy betrays him and this guy ends up you know that's fine but for the punisher and, I, and i'm saying i don't i love the punisher and i don't want him to be just a stupid guy with a bunch of guns and just runs and just kills people i wanted something a little bit more articulate than that but the Punisher's plan in the movie was just so unpunishery, and, and it's bad because they've got Thomas Jane. Mm -hmm. And I just remember when they first cast Thomas Jane, I was kind of like, I don't know who he is, but the look of the Punisher had evolved mm -hmm. from the original Punisher that we saw in Spider-Man, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. all the way to the Tim Bradstreet yes. version of Spider-Man uh, of, of Punisher. Punisher and Tim Bradstreet. For those that don't know, well worth googling. Just do a Google image search. You'll understand. Uh, during like the early two thousands, he was an artist that was kind of artist that was kind of doing a photorealistic style. Yes. and I'm sure you remember the first time Loved that it. I met him Loved at the Wizard great, World man. Convention Center. Mm -hmm. Great guy. It was an art style that I was trying to emulate because mm -hmm. it was something that you were not seeing in comics. Mm -mm. And when you saw him do a cover for the Punisher. You would almost pick up the comic just for that for cover, because just he, for the he cover was the, so the way amazing. he portrayed the Punisher mm -hmm. and the shadows, mm -hmm. the sunken face, the guns, the skulls, everything. He was pulling it off, and when you thought, okay, Thomas Jane's trying to do that version of the Punisher, this should be great. Mm -hmm. And then you hear about how he's trained for it, not only in weapons mm -hmm. physically, and he wants to do justice by the rendition of the Punisher mm -hmm. on the big screen. Mm -hmm. It's R rated. Mm -hmm. The uh, Blade came out in 1998, and that was an R rated movie. Here's the second superhero movie that's R rated. Uh, it's Lionsgate, so you know it's kind of like a smaller studio, but maybe they can pull off a few things. Yeah, this this movie was prime for one of my patented old school movie edits because if you take the first part of the movie, you mean a uh, Andre Walker special fan edit, fan edit of a say. Jonathan Hazley film. Exactly. By the way, that was who the director was. The first part of the movie was actually pretty interesting where Punisher was an undercover cop and a drug bust went bad and a drug guy got killed. So the drug kingpin played by John Travolta uh, wanted revenge on the Punisher. So he tracked him down and he actually did something in the, the books really doesn't address that Punisher, Frank Castle, I should stop calling the Punisher. Frank yeah. Castle, after the whole drug bust went bad, he went to Miami to, for a family reunion. And John Travolta wanted revenge. And actually, his wife was the one who really wanted the revenge. They ordered the mob mafia to waste the entire family. Yes. So they went down there and they just slaughtered every single member of the Punisher's family, which always answered to me because I always thought, does the Punisher, I mean, his family got killed, but that was his immediate family. Yes. Does he have any cousins or uncles and brothers and sisters? I always thought about that. And this actually made me think like, wow, they slaughtered his entire family. That's actually pretty freaking dark. His, he has no living relatives whatsoever that he knows of anyway. And then the part at the end was actually pretty cool. That was when we got to see a Punisher where he spray painted the skull on his chest. Yes. And this was it. He was going in there to take out John Travolta and kill him. And Howard Saint. He went out there mm -hmm. and started stabbing all the guys and he killed them and he stabbed one guy through the throat. Yes. And that actually felt like, a, I was like, okay, this is the Punisher movie. But by the time it got there, I was like, the middle stuff really drug me down. So if they could just take the first part and the second part and fix the middle, I could have went with a, probably a B level, C level Punisher movie, but the middle part was just so just like, and they borrowed from the Garth Ennis storyline yes. Punisher, which, I, which a lot of people love. I do not like the Garth Ennis storyline because it's too over the top. It's too silly. You got Punisher fighting, tricking a polar bear, punching a polar bear to attack mob guys. If I remember it wasn't because it, it was like, welcome back Frank. Welcome that was like back, the storyline. That was a storyline that they took. And that was a really bad, yes. that was doing the Marvel Max line where Marvel was doing a, 
uh, Marvel Knights, I think. Uh, they were doing a more hard, hard R-rated version of their comic books, and they got Garth Ennis to write the story for the Punisher, and he did, he created the, the Russian, and he created some of these crazy over-the-top characters, and it was just an over-the-top type of like Robert Rodriguez type of comic book, and I didn't like that Punisher. It was too silly. It was too it was too over the top. I, I didn't like that. And they took that and they tried to bring that to it. And, it, and the, the director, what was the director's name again? Oh, uh, Jonathan Heensley. He was a big Western fan and he had this Western thing yes. with the Punisher. And I remember there was one part where the Punisher actually had a quick draw match out with these guys. He was robbing a bank for this mafia bank. And I was like, what is what is this? I don't know what any of this is. So it, it was a, some good things in the movie, some interesting things in the movie. But overall, it was, for me, a disappointment for the yes. disappointment. And I remember reading, speaking of the comics, Punisher Warzone. Yes. The John Romita Jr. run. Yes. And I always remember because they set up this great relationship with him in Microchip. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, for me, it was my introduction to the Punisher. Yes. The scene where he's torturing a guy and he takes the ice cream. Ice cream, yeah. He, and he puts it on the guy's back. And I just remember thinking, okay, this is an interesting version of the Punisher. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, it, it's become... Different, especially now when we see Daredevil, I mean, Punisher in the new Daredevil series, Thomas Jane, the look of the movie, which was dark and, mm -hmm. and had a, a grittiness to it. John Travolta, I mean, anytime you cast him, you're essentially casting John Travolta. Mm -hmm. So, but he was lending some. He, you he know, actually wasn't too bad. And in the beginning, in the beginning of the movie, where he was grieving over his son's death. And his wife was playing sort of the Lady Macbeth. She was she was actually the more savage one. He wanted revenge on Frank, but she wanted revenge on the whole family. That aspect it was some things in there was actually pretty cool. It was later on where John Travolta John Travolta it up yes. that he kind of you know, how it's saying he became this crazy over the top just cartoony bad guy again that it really lost whatever potential it had. It was just it was just. This is not a. It was better. It was better than the Duff Lundgren Punisher movie. Absolutely, yes. But better, Although, better than crap what? does not make you gold. This is true. What, what, yes. what is it? What is the line in the Daredevil movie? Just because somebody you call somebody else bad doesn't make you good. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Punisher two thousand four mm. is bad. Yes. Just a quick interruption to remind you that the Fan to Fan podcast is online. You can find us at fanpodcast.com where you'll be able to hear new episodes, archived episodes, and you'll be able to connect with us on social media, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. And now, on with the show. After a really good first movie, Spider-Man gets a second movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's in 2004. Uh, so it continues the franchise. Mm -hmm. Another record-breaking version as far as opening day. Uh, I mean, Spider-Man 2, I remember thinking, okay... This is, again, Sam Raimi as the director. We get Tobey Maguire again, except now we are going into a different villain territory. So the first one introduced in is Green Goblin and William Dafoe. Great job with that. Set up Kirsten Dunst, uh, set up James Franco, all these characters, all these, you know, Osbournes. And now you have a whole new version in... Doc Ock? Doc Ock, yeah. yeah. And I thought the casting... Was um, ridiculous. Yes. Listen, Spider-Man 2, uh, to me, I, 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 like I said, the two, there's another movie on that we're going to talk about that I think is the best sequel as far as superhero movies out there. But everybody, a lot of people regard Amazing Spider-Man 2. Is it? No, no Spider-Man 2. Spider not Spider-Man 2. Yeah. Spider-Man 2. Although I remember a time when they said they were going to name them based on the adjective. Yeah. So Spider-Man, then Spider-Man Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. But uh, it was a, to this day, people could still consider Spider-Man 2 the finest sequel to a superhero movie ever. The emotional strains, the the action sequences, the casting. Um, the call-outs to the comic scenes. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things in there that go back to Spider-Man comics. Mm -hmm. If I remember right, that's is that the scene where they do the Spider-Man No More? Spider-Man No More, a classic scene with him throwing the a collapse suit. of everything in kind of like the New York Harbor mm -hmm. in, in Otto Octavius's kind of like laboratory. Mm -hmm. And you have the scene of Spider-Man holding up the rafters, mm -hmm. the scene from that famous comic book cover. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a lot of things in there that they did right. And, and, and things and, that they continued doing well from the first one. Yeah, and, and the character development and everything was great. To this day, I still think, I, 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 I forgot it. 
his name right now, B, the villain. I forget the actor. Alfred Molina. Alfred Molina. Alfred Molina. Yes. Alfred Molina. Alfred Molina's performance before he became Doctor uh, Octopus uh, as 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 Otto Octavius was terrific. Was terrific. He was a he was smart. A good father. He figure. was the father figure. He was he wasn't playing a snacky, snarly sort of snily whiplash type of villain. And when he turned to Otto Octavius, he still remained his humanity. He was a little bit more cocky, a little bit more arrogant, but he wasn't cartoony. Mm. He was still he was menacing. And I think Sam Raimi did an excellent job of not going with CG with the tentacles and yes. keeping them practical because he made them scarier and he made them more intimidating. The fact that they were like a a prop, sort of like the Aliens movie where they had the thing behind them and it was puppeteered with the tentacles were used with puppets. They, those tentacles look, still to this day look amazing. Doc Ock has always been one of, not just Spider-Man's, it's one of the best visually uh, villains in comic books with those tentacles and one of Spider-Man's most dangerous villains with his ability to attack Spider-Man physically and match him mentally. And Alpha Molina did a great job of portraying somebody who was smart and dangerous. My favorite scene is still probably the train scene at the end where, he's, where Spider-Man saves everybody on the train. I really, really like this movie. I didn't like as much as this other sequel we're going to talk about in this in the show, but I thought this was a great sequel. I thought that Sam Raimi knocked it out of the park again, and it deserved to make all the money they did, and 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 it just shows what what happens when you get somebody who's passionate about a character and a project and let him be, and you see what you get. And when I say let him be, you'll see what I'm talking about when we get to another movie. Yes, and one thing I'll throw in or else about uh, Spider Man Two is they started. I think they all the, after the success of the first one, they wanted to set up other movies. Mm -hmm. So they're starting to introduce Doctor Kurt Connors, yes. who was uh, act, uh, the actor was Dylan Baker. Yes, uh, but then they start throwing in John Jameson, who's J. Jonah Jameson's son. Mm -hmm. So then you start thinking to yourself, "Oh, is there going to be an alien costume? Are we eventually going to see Venom?" But you've got all of these different things. Uh, J.K. Simmons killed it again as J. Jonah Jameson. Disgusting. I mean, just... We didn't mention him in the first but Spider-Man, but he was amazing as J. Jonah Jameson. And he should be still be considered for the... It's too late now because he's playing Jim Gordon in the Justice League movies, but he, he, he I would have been... Nobody would have been upset if he'd have been cast as uh, J. Jonah Jameson in the new Spider-Man movies. Absolutely, yes. There would have been a, a good role for him to just yes. continue to take because he, he's got that down pat. So 2004, New Line comes out with the third appropriately called Blade Trinity, the third movie in the Blade franchise. So this one is directed by David Goyer, who co-wrote the first one and the second one. He's got his first directorial debut mm -hmm. after maybe getting himself some credits after the first two movies. Mm -hmm. He's got Wesley Snipes. He's mm -hmm. got the studio. And then here we go. To pun intended, this is what happens when a franchise gets a little long in the tooth. Blade, I think, had ran out of juice after the sequel. I think David Goyer kind of, uh, he was, if you really wanted to do something with the franchise, he was not the director to go with it. I mean, they cast Triple H, you know, as one of the vampires, which is fine. I mean, that's the wrong casting. With, with a poodle as a pet? Yeah. Uh, no. And and, the, and David Goyer was, was weird. He had an affection for, I think the movie was called, what was the name of that? Best in Show? Yes. And he ended up casting a lot of actors from that. Parker Posey was Parker in Posey, that movie. Parker Posey, the yes. actor who played the one psychiatrist vampire, I forget his name. He had a lot of, and he thought that movie was funny, so he brought that over to Blade, which is... You're talking about Blade and Best in Show, not a lot of leeway to say that you can mix genres with that. But the one thing that movie is really famous for, if anything, was this the first time that we got to see Ryan Reynolds as a badass. Because Ryan Reynolds to that point was a comedic actor and he played Van Wilder and he was silly. But when he got cast as Hannibal King and they saw him in shape and they looked at him like, oh, yes. you know how tall you know, Ryan Reynolds is like 6'3"? You know, Ryan Reynolds is, is a, you know what I mean? Because nobody thought of how tall and how big Ryan Reynolds was before then because he was always playing comedic roles. But when you saw him as Hannibal King, you kind of went like, hey, this guy's kind of badass. He he is doing a good job as a badass. And plus, he's got the sar sarcastic tone. It was it was a precursor. His Hannibal King, you look at his Hannibal King and tell me that that is not Wade Wilson pre-Deadpool when he in that movie. That is probably much the biggest thing that can come out of that movie. You got... Um, Dominic, I forget his last name, uh, from Prison Break playing Dracula and get Blade oh, yeah. versus Dracula, yes. who plays now uh, Fire, a uh, human uh, heat wave on the, the on the Legends, Legends of, of Tomorrow. Tomorrow. 
and he he chewed up scenery and it was just horrible and it was just horrible and it was just horrible that's they, enough they kill whistler oh, yes horrible. we can move on from blade trinity not a great movie in the marvel cinematic universe no it's not b 2005 Speaking of another movie that's not very good, Electra. Oh, boy. We went to the show. Let me take the lead on this beat. We went to the show to see this movie, and we thought, you know what? I, if I remember correctly, I thought the trailer was decent enough, and we always liked the story with the hand and, you know, you know Marvel's version of League of, Sha- League of Assassins. Ninjas are always cool. Yes. And the Hand is actually a really cool organization that because they're the equal of the League of League of Assassins in DC. But we thought maybe this could be pretty interesting, you know. And it got Terrence Stamp as Stick. I mean, can you get better than Terrence Stamp as Stick? It's General Zod. I mean, it's awesome. But my everlasting, ever loving God, was this a piece of crap? I think like the first two minutes was cool. When they first show her in the red kind of costume, when it, when uh, Jason Isaacs is sitting in his chair telling the stories about Electra, well, this isn't good, but it's not horrible. And that was the high point. That was the high point. That I was remember the high watching point. the movie and thinking, oh my God. Especially in hindsight, but even at the time, I thought this should be the easiest one for Marvel to do. Not because it's, you don't know anything about Electra, so you're not expecting anything. You mm-hmm. know she's related to Daredevil, but Daredevil's not in this movie. This is really a solo film for Electra, Jennifer Garner, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it should be an action film with mm-hmm. lots of ninjas. But mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you start feeling like you're watching Mortal Kombat 3. Yes! And the villains are so outrageous, but not outrageous in a... Oh, this is kind of cool way, not in a, this is a movie that we both appreciate, Ninja Scroll. Yeah. Ninja Scroll, anime from probably the mid-90s. Yeah. That if you ask a lot of fanboys, and if you guys are listening, you probably know about it. Great movie, well worth watching, if not owning. And I thought, okay, if they're going to do something kind of like Daredevil the movie meets Ninja Scroll, if Elektra is somewhere in there, that'll be pretty cool. But instead, you just felt like you were watching... A really shitty version of Mortal Kombat, and really? it just happened to have Electra in it. Yes, it was just just horrible. It was it was bad. Can we continue with bad? I got another one at you. Two thousand five. All two thousand five hits us with Man Thing. I never seen Man Thing. No, I know. Okay, I so, remember it was a movie that was released, and I don't think it was ever released, and it ended up no, airing on Sci Fi Channel. It was. It was released on Sci Fi Channel. I just remember thinking, okay, I like Swamp Thing. I liked this first Swamp Thing movie. I like Adrian Barbu in Swamp Thing, of especially as a teenager. I was yes, like, oh, I like, well, yes, okay. Yes, uh, yes. Especially from The Fog. I loved her. Yeah. Um, but then I thought, okay, Man Thing, this is kind of different. All right. So this is one of those, I'm assuming, licenses that probably wasn't swiped up after Spider-Man was released. Mm-hmm. And we know we could probably do a whole episode just about Marvel's financial turmoil Mm -hmm. in like the 80s and 90s where they sold rights to different movie companies toy companies Mm -hmm. and it took forever to kind of become what they are exactly once once disney uh, purchased them to exactly yeah yeah. and since then you know having just mentioned electra that those rights went back to marvel Mm -hmm. and that's why we see her in the netflix uh series Mm -hmm. uh for daredevil but man thing flip on the radar it wasn't very good it was a sci-fi channel essentially made for TV movie that was trying to gritty up the idea of Swamp Thing in a kind of horror movie slasher genre I way. It was, I think it was shot in Australia and it was, it was Australian actors trying to speak with American accents, trying to pretend they were in the swamp or something. It, it, I didn't see the movie. I'm just talking about what people said about the movie. They said it was pretty bad and the CG for the man thing was pretty bad i heard so it, i can't really judge the movie i haven't seen it so if anybody who's seen the movie i'm sorry but uh yeah that was another one of those marvel movies you go what happened yeah and i'm sure there's probably potential there not that we'll probably ever see it no no, no. um but he, he did make an appearance in the spider-man animated tv show uh howling howling commandos but they rechanged it and made all those horror characters they put the man thing in there and he was kind of like basically Groot from Guardians of the galaxy yes. if you ever see it so yes but uh yeah i, I don't think we'll be we'll seeing any man thing uh no i think man thing is going to be dead after that 2005 release yeah uh 2005 fox releases the fantastic four <sighs> yeah so we have jessica alba as sue storms Slash the Invisible Woman, beautiful woman, love her in a, a Dark Angel. Yes, not who I would have cast as Sue Storm. Nope, Ian Gruffold, who played uh, Reed Richards, Mister Fantastic. Not a not a bad choice as Mister Fantastic. The problem with him is that he 
is the Mr. Fantastic from the books who is kind of boring and unlikable. And he plays Mr. Fantastic as somebody who's not unlikable, but he's just boring. And he plays and Fanta- Mr. Fantastic exactly the way Mr. Fantastic is. Yes. But the problem is Mr. Fantastic is boring and unlikable and you kind of don't really care about him. And he did, he played Mr. Fantastic exactly the way you, he is in a book and really didn't help juice up the movie. Michael Chiklis is the thing. Who was a great casting as yes. the thing. He put all his effort into it. Horrible makeup job. But Michael Chiklis was one of the good things about that Fantastic Four movie that he he gave it his all. He he put his heart in it. He looked like the thing. He sounded like the thing. And it was prosthetic. It wasn't CGI. It wasn't like it was the slight. Hulk before. It was, it, was, it, was, it was better than the uh, Roger Corman's thing costume. But like I said, one ma- just because you call that bad, don't make this good. Chris Evans as the Human Torch. Universally, everybody agrees that he was the best thing about the Fantastic Four movies. He captured Johnny Storm's persona even better than the books. Because in the books, Johnny Johnny Storm is sort of a punk. He's sort of a cocky jerk. And this one, he kind of, this was uh, Chris Evans doing his Tony Stark. He was a jerk, but he was a likable jerk. He, he didn't hate Johnny Storm. He didn't want him to fail. He, you know, in the books, Johnny Storm is always too cocky and too arrogant and too hot-headed. You know, the whole hot-headed thing, they take too far in the books. But in this one, they made him, he made him likable. He liked Johnny Storm. Chris yes, Evans is yes. such a likable, charming actor. He did a great job as Johnny Storm. Yeah, and he's played quite a few superheroes. He played Human Torch. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, now he plays Captain America. In between, he was in the movie The Losers. Yes. Which was also a DC Comics adaptation. Mm -hmm. Um, So he's not afraid of doing comic book movies. But Human Torch, he he, he hit it out of the ballpark. I forget the one movie he did with the... uh, It was shot in Japan where they had psychic powers. It was a Japanese comic book, I think it was. Okay. He was in it. Jaiman Hanzu was the main villain inside the movie. Um, when you Dakota think- Fanning, I think she was one of the girls in it. And everybody had special... Push. Push. That's what it was. Yeah, they were talking it about... It was around the same time as it was a jumper yeah. came out. Yeah, uh, so I think that was a Japanese book that they made that into a book. And they're talking about actually making that to a TV series still from Sci-Fi Channel. So, yeah, he has had a track record with superhero type movies. And he... Yeah, and so, genre films, like he did Snowpiercer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was a, a good, a good yeah, movie. Yeah. Yeah, good movie, good movie, good movie. Yeah. So. Um, so Fantastic Four comes out. I This is, okay, we've had this discussion a bunch of times. So Andre and I have had this belief for quite a long time. There are a number of properties, superhero properties, Batman that can translate to, su- to, to films. X-Men has been proven, translates. Superman translates. The Fantastic Four, in my opinion does not translate it is very difficult to take these four characters based on their powers to take seriously where does this go see i think that you could do a fantastic four movie if you get a good solid director to get a hold of the characters the problem with the fantastic four is we had the fantastic four movie now i mean the fantastic those the fantastic movie we're talking about today yes and that fantastic four movie that movie was a direct result of the Incredible Hulk movie because Fox went too, I mean, Universal went too serious with the movie. So Universal, so Fox wanted to take the Fantastic Four in a more lighthearted tone. The problem is they went too lighthearted. And we'll probably talk about the new Fantastic Four movie where they swung the pendulum back and tried to say, okay, the first, you didn't like, you know, the uh, Michael Chiklis Fantastic Four movie. So let's go back. I think you got to find that sweet spot, sort of like between Force Awakens, which or Gar- maybe in Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy, I think, would be a perfect tone for the Fantastic Four movie. Fun, lighthearted, but you can still be action-packed and, and serious at some times in the movie. I think the powers can be done greatly. I think power translate great. The rock guy. You got to figure out if you're going to do the... I think you should stick with the guy in the CG version of the thing. That's the best way to do the thing. Torch is still the coolest character in the, in the bunch. The Invisible Woman's powers can be portrayed. Mr. Fantastic's powers is the toughest ones to do. The problem I think with Mr. Fantastic, I would change his power if I was director from maybe stretching to maybe shape-shifting. You know what I mean? Maybe he could okay. And that's one of those things where you yeah. feel like, do they feel like they have to be so faithful to the comic adaptation? I mean, exactly. if it doesn't work, you change it. Yeah. And I've always been of the belief that the Fantastic Four, if you're going to if you're going to tackle them in a cinematic version, you have to t- embrace the fact that they have a lot of sci-fi elements. Exactly. And if you're going to embrace that, that means that it doesn't just have to be a superhero movie. It can be a sci-fi movie with superhero elements That's in it. That's the key, what we've been talking about. Yes. You make a science fiction movie 
that happens to have the Fantastic Four characters. And we'll probably talk about later on. There was a lot of smart ideas that I thought that they did with the new Fantastic Four movie, which I have not seen, so I'm not going to bash it. But there were some ideas in that movie that they brought up, and I'll wait till we get to that point. But there were some ideas that they did, science, science fiction-wise, that they did some good, smart ideas for that movie. Now you just need to bridge the gap. Find that sci-fi interstellar and try to... I know it's, I know it's tough. You got to find your interstellar and you got to find your Guardians of the Galaxy and you got to try to meet them in yes. the middle and get a director who could bring interstellar and Guardians... Because basically, the Fantastic Four are explorers. Yes. They're not heroes. They're explorers. You got to get to their core. If you get to their core of who they are, like Captain America, he is not a hero. He is a soldier. You get to the core of who the character is... And then you can find out who the character, what the character should be doing. So if you get that, if you like I said, if you can get those two parties together and get a director who can find that divide, maybe like a Brad Bird, maybe like a who you'd have to have someone that could embrace the I don't want to say old school or pulp, mm -hmm. but the almost like fun. Yeah, because Brad Bird did that in The Incredibles. Yes, but where you he can't just be said, too fun. We you have a family. Yes. No, you can't go. You can't go you can't campy go like Lost in Space. Yes, you can't have a family no, no, no. that. And even the Lost in Space movie where they tried to make it too gritty. No, no, and exactly. then you lost all the elements exactly. of what made it Lost in Space. Exactly. So if you did the Fantastic Four, you have to have this sort of. You know what? Time is available. A, uh, space travel is available, but you can't go too far. But you have to find that sweet spot mm -hmm. where you can take these characters, take advantage of their powers, but in a way where you can make them adventurers. You can make them scientists. Four characters that are a family exactly. that are going through all of these different adventures. They just happen to be superheroes in that way, but ultimately they really are sci-fi adventures. Exactly. And one last thing before we move on, I would please like for somebody to do a Fantastic Four movie correctly so I can finally have a proper Doctor Doom portrayed in live action. Yes. It hurts my heart more than it hurts my heart more that they screwed up Doom than the Punisher. And two that's villains who should be two a villain and a hero should who should be easy to do. Especially when you see that what Marvel has done with Tony Stark in a metal suit. Get, get, get a good actor like uh, Jason Isaacs. Put him in a metal suit. Put a Clayton cloak on him. And let's do this. It's bad because Doctor Doom is so tied up with the Fantastic Four mm -hmm. that Fox, who has the rights for the Fantastic Four, well, has Doom. Mm -hmm. But think about if you took out... I mean, I know what Marvel's doing now with Ultron and everything else and Thanos. But imagine if you were able to take Doom as one of the main villains... I mean, uh, if you cast the right actor, I mean, that would be terrific because you could have someone who could bring in technology, magic. Michael Fassbender. There you go. Michael Fassbender would be terrific. You could bring in politics, bring in that Viria. I mean, and now with what they're doing with Wakanda and the Black Panther. And he fits right into the whole Infinity Gauntlet storyline because who would be the person who who would be the best person that the, the Avengers would need to go to to try to stop Thanos and get the Infinity Gauntlet. The smartest man, the most dangerous man in the world, Doom. A man who can combine technology, mysticism, uh, and they could even bring in like elements of espionage in there. Oh, yeah. So you could have a Black Widow and a Hawkeye and a Captain America breaking into Latveria to get someone out, causing an international S A war affair. between Latveria and Wakanda. And, oh, my goodness. And Wakanda's another place that has but, supernatural... But guess what, you can't have any of that. No, you can't have any because of that. Because Fox has Doom, Fox because has they Doom, have the Fantastic Four. And we are Four. all doomed. I'll conclude my conversation with Andre in a second as we continue to go over the Marvel movie history. In the meantime, if you are on iTunes, please take a few seconds to rate and review the Fan to Fan podcast. I would greatly appreciate it. It'll get it in the eyes of more folks, more fans like me and yourself. So please check us out on iTunes, subscribe and rate and review. Thanks. 2006, X-Men, The Last Stand, the last movie in the X-Men franchise. Brian Singer is busy out directing Superman Returns. Mm -hmm. He takes with him James Marsden, who's Cyclops. That's why Cyclops doesn't have a lot of screen time. But they bring in Rush Hour director Brett Ratner Brett the Rat to take Rat over the directorial reins. This has been a heated conversation with me and a lot of fans. And I know, like I said before, I'm going to get a lot of flack from this. I did not hate X-Men Last Stand. Yes, they got a lot of stuff wrong. Yes, there was some goofiness to it. Yes, there was some characterizations that they screwed up the Phoenix Saga. Totally screwed up the Phoenix Saga that Brian Singer had set up and planned. Totally agree with that. 
But in comparison to me, I enjoyed X-Men Last Stand more than I enjoyed the original X-Men movie. There were a lot of things that were cool in, a, in the X-Men uh, Last Stand movie that I liked. At the bridge scene where Magneto lifts the Golden Gate Bridge up to use to carry all his X-Men over to the, the prison island is still probably one of the best. It's not probably the best Magneto moment in any of the movies. He That looks amazing. When, when Ian McKellen lifts up the bridge and carries across, it looks epic. Kelsey Grammer was cast as the Beast. And that reminds me that originally this was Matthew Vaughn's movie. Matthew Vaughn was originally supposed to direct this movie, but he dropped out because of creative differences with Fox. So they had to grab Brett Ratner at the last minute. And in Brett Ratner's defense, he was not allowed to do any changes or touches up to the script. They, he had to shoot this script as it was, and he had to shoot it in the schedule that they gave him. So that's why the movie is so sh much shorter. The movie was supposed to be planned a lot longer. It was supposed to be a two, two and a half hour epic finale. When Bra when Matthew Vaughn left mid production, Fox was in a bind, and, and they didn't want to lose the, the you know precious release date because you know these release dates are set in stone, and it, you got if you move the release date for some of these big tempo franchises, it changes a lot of things, and you have to go up against other movies. So they brought Brett Ratner in, and he had to shoot the movie as is and cram it out in the schedule that they had. So in his defense, this was not the movie that he wanted. And this was not the movie that was supposed to be with when Matthew Vaughn left. So it's kind of nobody's fault and everybody's fault at the same time. Just just to put that out there. But the casting of, of Vinnie Jones as Juggernaut, I thought was pretty cool. Even though they put him in the uh, Ricardo Montalban muscle suit to give him fake muscles. He's still you know, pretty cool Juggernaut. We got to finally see X-Men fight against other mutants. It was pretty cool. Yes, they were nondescript crappy mutants and they could have really pulled off some really cool and i will say that last moment where wolverine is on that mound while all the mutants are attacking yeah he's uh right there with gene gray yeah and he has to take her out and she's and blowing off all the flesh off of him i thought that was a pretty cool scene. that was a good moment but mm -hmm. the movie itself for what I'm sure they didn't want it to be the end of the franchise, mm -hmm. but for what ended up becoming the uninter the interrupted end before mm -hmm. Michael Vaughn took it up again in first class. Mm -hmm. So they end up going back to him mm -hmm. when they reboot the franchise. The movie itself, it's kind of unmemorable to me. Yeah, it's it's not, it's not like I said, like like I said with Daredevil, it's not a movie I'm going to sit here and fight you with. Like you don't know what you're talking about. This was great. I did not hate it as much as everybody else. I'll say that I didn't I didn't say I loved it. I just didn't hate it as much as everybody else. I came out of the movie theater going, okay, there was some cool stuff in here. I got to see Magneto and Juggernaut, and I got to see some of my characters I like. I, you know, it was, it was okay. I got to see Beast. I got to see Amazing Beast. So, I'm okay. I, I, I was decent with what I saw. You know, I wasn't terribly excited. They they did screw up the Phoenix Saga, but, you know, well, what are you going to do? My, my, the Brian Singer was not there, and, and, you know, you got the best they could get, get for that movie. So, Were you terribly excited for 2007's Mark Steven Johnson's directed Columbia produced version of Marvel's Ghost Rider. I was excited. I am a Ghost Rider fan. And I know I will sit here and tell you that Ghost Rider is one of the most shallow characters in comics. He is a visual. He is, is a poster. Ghost Rider is one of there are some characters in comic books who really don't have any history or backstory or depth. They just look cool. Ghost Rider, the flaming skull head just looks cool. And I like Ghost Rider. I could not tell you that I know some of the history of Ghost Rider, but there is no real history of Ghost Rider. I just like the flaming skull head and the leather jacket. It looks badass to me. So I had high hopes for it. The trailer looked like an action 90s action movie trailer. It, Mark, felt, it felt like it was directed by the director of Daredevil. It felt and like it was directed by the director it, of Daredevil. It, it was a guy. This era, you ever For you football fans or sports fans out there, you ever have those head coaches who leave and then come back and you realize the game has passed them by? Mark Steven Johnson was one of those guys who was still stuck in the 90s. Yes. I mean, this was totally, and you got Nicolas Cage, 90 in it is it up, Nicolas Cage in it up, and you got bad CG and rock music, and it's just, I mean, he looked cool. I'll give him that. The Ghost Rider looked cool with the flaming skull, and he sounded cool with the, uh, the amplified voice and everything, but yeah, this was, as, as much as I thought the Daredevil movie was not as bad as people thought it was, this movie was as bad as people thought it was. Even Mendez, the beautiful woman, great actress, 
Wasted completely. Wasted this. completely. Sam Elliott, another another Marvel movie for him. Wasted for his And it's interesting because we're talking about uh, in Punisher how there were these kind of strange, out of nowhere Western elements. Yeah. And Ghost Rider had a lot of these very Western elements. Well, the original where... character was a Western sure, and, sure. and everything. And I think Mark Stephen Johnson's like, I'm going to take the old Ghost Rider Western and mix it with the modern day Ghost Rider Western for no reason. Why not? So it was, it was weird. It was, it was weird. Yeah, it's uh, we'll eventually get a sequel a few years later. Mm -hmm. uh, but speaking of sequels, in 2007, we got two other sequels to Marvel movies. Spider-Man 3 and Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. So let's start up with Spider-Man 3. So this time we get the thing that fanboys have probably been asking for from the second that Spider-Man comes out, because the second you say Spider-Man is on the silver screen, that means there's a possibility of Venom. Mm -hmm. And that's what we got. Again, directed by Sam Raimi. Record-breaking, again, so that's kind of like par for the course for the Spider-Man franchise. Spider-Man 3 should be shown in studios and film classes as the textbook movie of studio interference. As you said that Venom was a fan favorite and he was a character that people wanted to see in the third one. And ultimately, that's what really hurt the movie because Sam Raimi does not like Venom. Sam Raimi is a Spider-Man fan, but Sam Raimi is a old uh, Steve Ditko, Stan Lee Spider-Man fan. He loves the classic villains. He didn't understand Venom. He did not like Venom. And I and I don't blame him. And there's characters that I don't like in the uh, Spider-Man Lord. I like People really like that guy, and there's characters that are like we really like this character. Or that character is pretty cool. I understand that he did not understand Venom. He did not like Venom, but the studio knew that they wanted another hit on their hands, and people were just chomping at the bit for Venom. And Sam Raimi had a script already planned with the Sandman and the Vulture, but the studio forced him to put Venom in the movie. Sam Raimi said, "Fine, if you're going to have me put this character in the movie." I'm going to make a Venom that I want and not the Venom from the book. So he ended up changing Venom's character to be a anti-Peter Parker, which, which if everybody who's read the books knows that's not who Eddie Brock is. He took Topher Grace, who I thought would have been an excellent choice to play Peter Parker. Yes. He took Topher Grace and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make this guy the anti, the dark Peter Parker. Peter Parker's nice. This guy's arrogant. Peter Parker, Peter Parker's nice. This guy's rude. Peter Parker's humble. This guy's arrogant. So when the symbiote suit bonds with him, you get the dark Peter Parker. That's his whole analogy why Venom has the dark suit. And it never worked. It was horrible. It felt shoehorned. And there were some bits and pieces in this movie that were actually good. The first half of the movie, well, not just the first, the first couple of scenes in the movie before the infamous scene where Harry and Peter had the hobgoblin or, or skateboard goblin. I don't know what kind of goblin you call that. His goblin costume fight. That was actually pretty cool and intense where, where he told Aunt May that he was going to get married and everything. And she gave him Uncle Ben's ring that he gave her to give to Mary Jane. I thought that was like, wow. And the, one of the most powerful scenes in the movie, and the scene that was great, was the Sandman scene. Yes. The scene where the Sandman forms for the first time, where he goes, for no reason, he goes into this nuclear generator to run from cops and he gets turned to sand. And the scene where he tries to form himself and yes. he grabs his girl's locket and he grabs it and you see him turn. Powerful scene. Yes. Amazing scene. Willpower, and emotion. You can just see that Sam Raimi has something special with the Sandman, but it couldn't be because he had to do this thing with Venom. It didn't even explain where the alien costume came from. Just some black block just flat crashed on the ground and it attached to Spider-Man for no reason. They didn't do no backstory about a, a astronaut landing or a chemical thing from the ultimate Spider-Man storyline. It was some black goop that fell from the sky because that's what Spider-Man, that's what Sam Raimi thought of uh, Venom. Some black goop from, fell from the sky. And you wonder if they had taken out Venom. Mm -hmm. and, and put Sam the Raimi. vulture in and let him do his vulture because yeah, he wanted, he wanted, uh, I can't think of his name, in the line of fire, Malcolm, J John Malkovich. Yes. He wanted John Malkovich as the vulture. Would have been great casting. And he wanted, uh, I don't know who he wanted, but he wanted Sandman in the movie. That was his cast. That was his dream cast. Originally, after this movie bombed, he planned to actually do that sequel for Spider-Man 4, but then they pulled it away from him. So yeah, Spider-Man 3 is the, should be shown in classes of what happens when the studio interferes with a creative process of a director, and you're not one-on-one. -on -one. You force a director to do a storyline and do characters that he doesn't want to do. You get a movie that people 
turn. I mean, the scene where Spider Man is dancing in the streets. Everybody knows when Spider Man. Evil Pe- Spider Man. When Peter Parker gets the black symbiote suit, he becomes dark, evil, moody. He doesn't come emo and big and he gets the hair curl. That's what Sam Raimi's idea of what evil is. He just did not like Venom. And this was a bad pairing from the start. It would have been better even without the Vulture if they had just focused on Sandman yeah. with Thomas Hayden Church mm-hmm. kind of doing the sympathetic villain. Mm-hmm. So that way they could have had a nice kind of like character arc where Spider-Man, Peter Parker, you know, kind of gone back to the idea of losing his Uncle Ben, uh, Uncle Ben to a common criminal. Mm-hmm. And that's what Sandman is, right? Mm-hmm. Except now that he's no longer a common criminal because he has powers, it becomes a matter of what are you going to do with him? Again, with great power comes great responsibility. They could have been able to wrap that up, but people want to see Venom. And at some point, there's probably a studio exec that says, you know what, if we introduce Venom into this, maybe we can do something with him. We can continue this in the future. We have Topher Grace, Topher Grace, who great actor. Mm-hmm. And again, like you said, I feel like he could have played Peter Parker and probably could do it really well. Mm-hmm. But you're kind of shoehorning it into a movie that's already jam packed. Mm-hmm. And this is going back to the Batman Returns precedent. Two villains. You have Catwoman. You have Penguin. You've got to set up a Sandman. And who's going to be our other villain? Well, why can't we just leave him on his own? Well, this way we can make more toys for the people who don't know who who Sandman is. Mm -hmm. They'll know who Venom is and they'll want to be there to see who that is. So it was disappointing to say the least, uh, but we wouldn't see Spidey again uh, for a while Mm -hmm. because he would be completely rebooted when we got Amazing Spider-Man a few years later. Mm -hmm. So kind of wrapping up the Fantastic Four series, um, the second one, Rise of the Silver Surfer, comes out in 2007 by Fox. It's more of the same. It's more of the same. I mean, the the kind of, I think the only things that I can think of is that uh, you have the introduction of Silver Surfer, who's played by Doug Jones, Mm -hmm. and we know him as Abe Sapien from Mm -hmm. the Hellboy movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's voiced by Lawrence Fishburne. They try to do a few different things in this movie. I mean, they have the introduction of Galactus, and you think, kind of what we just said, the sci-fi element would come out they would let them explore and kind of delve into the kind of uh interstellar you know like cosmic and, abilities and, and even that even that again it's studio interference because they tell tim story that he can do this but then they say you, you can't they, they, they're they already thinking about doing a silver Surfer spin-off movie so they don't want to really get into silver Surfer's origin they don't really they told tim story that he couldn't he could put a galactus like character in the movie but not galactus because they don't want a galactus in this movie they want to save it for the silver surfer movie can you do this movie first and let this movie be good and then worry about a spinoff movie because they were thinking if the fir- if this movie is successful then we could do a spinoff for the silver surfer and do his own movie so we don't want you to do galactus that's why galactus is a giant cloud because tim story couldn't do a galactus the way he wanted to he had to do something and that's what that's what it was and it let this movie be successful before you start thinking about the s- multiple spinoffs you could do with this movie they I mean, put the nail in their own coffin because they canceled the third film. All the actors had a three film deal. They had the idea of like playing around with the Inhumans, the Scrolls, and Nihilus, the Negative Zone, mm-hmm. which probably would have been neat if you took it in that sci fi element. Uh, but because Rise of the Silver Surfer performed so poorly, 20th Century Fox puts a nix on the future of the series. Mm -hmm. They don't develop it any further. The actors move on because there's just no way that they're going to get people to come back Mm -hmm. and do this. And even when they go back later and they bring in like Matthew Vaughn, Josh Trank, uh, and they eventually develop the the next one, they've just never been able to get Fantastic Four right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that is the end of part two of our Marvel Cinematic History uh, walkthrough. I uh, hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, if you listen to part one, uh, this was more along the same lines, and we'll have a part three where we'll talk about what is kind of the present day version of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Everything from Iron Man, Wolverine, Thor, and of course, Captain America. So please join us for that one and uh, enjoy. That's it for this episode. Tune in next time for more fan-to-fan conversations on the Fan-to-Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. The time has come to direct all further attacks against the planet Earth.